All right, well, welcome back to church. Things are a little bit different than before, as you guys can see. Hey, kids, a little bit different than before. No junior church, no coffee, no refreshments. Uh, but we're glad you're here. We're glad we could open our doors. You guys are the second uh, wave. Um, and there were supposed to be more people here. They just canceled this morning. So don't feel like, man, I'm coming to the most pathetic church service in history uh, because you're not. Um, but we are glad that you guys are here. And again, things are different with COVID-19. We're only allowed to have so many people, um, but God is still working. God is still good. And we are glad that we can finally be together after three months. Uh, I'm glad to see faces and have faces to preach to uh, yet again, instead of looking at a camera that shows only my ugly mug. So um, if you guys have Bibles, we're in 1 John chapter 3. And if you, uh, as you guys turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, we... Um, we have covered a lot of ground, and to, to get to chapter 3, we've covered a lot of theology, and I hope that you guys have been able to follow along with us online as we work through uh, the first parts. Otherwise, you guys may come in this morning and be like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's okay. Hopefully, we'll be able to still draw some applications. We bring ourselves uh, to the same place in the scriptures this morning. So, 1 John chapter 3, we're going to be in verses 4 through 10. And if you think about the world in which we live today... It doesn't take long to see that the world is full of things and people that really don't love or care about God. You guys agree with that? Look at the world that we live in. There's a lot of people that, that could care less about God. We have seen God removed from schools and from, uh, from other institutions. And we've watched society run almost full tilt the other way away from God and Yet we find ourselves this morning, as we begin to open the Word of God, as, as human beings having the tendency to want to kind of make that okay. We want to make sin not as bad as it is. We want to justify it. We want to lessen its intensity and severity. And the reason I know that is because we were all kids at one point in time, were we not? Some of you guys are kids here this morning. I can ask the kids in church this morning, how many of you guys have ever done something you got in trouble for? Okay. Is that kind of maybe? Well, I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we all have. We all have, right? So let me just ask you this. If you guys got in trouble, my kids are in the back too, they can answer too. If you guys had any adults too, when you were when you were a kid and you got in trouble for something, did you ever try to make it like it wasn't that big of a deal? Anybody? I did. It was like my go-to default response as a child, right? I'm just, uh, I'm not going to make it as bad. Dad, you're really overreacting. It's really not that bad. I know, Dad, I just tried to light the neighbor's lot on fire. It really wasn't that bad. Nothing happened. We try to lessen what we did. Or if, let's say, for example, like when we were kids, how many of you guys ever got caught telling a lie? Everybody kind of sheepishly raised their hand. Did you guys ever try to make an excuse for the lie you told? I don't know everything. You don't know everything? That's okay. But that's what, the other thing we do is we try to make a, 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 an excuse for why we did what we did. We, we justify and condone sinful behavior. And as human beings, we, we tend to do this often because we also have this uh, part of us that is carnal and fleshly and doesn't want to serve or follow God. And really what it comes down to, when we think about our choices in life, and especially when we've done something wrong, we've done something sinful, we've done something bad... We have two options before us. The first is to justify it or condone it and therefore make sin okay in our lives. Or the other option we have is to repent and turn from it and run the other direction and eradicate it from our lives. Those are the two options we have when we're confronted with sin in our life. We can either repent it and, and, and turn from it or we can condone it and justify it in our lives. Now, if we're justifying sin in our lives, is that not kind of a dangerous place to be before God? We already covered that a couple weeks ago. But also, when we think about this, we also want to, as we looked at last week, to live in light of eternity, don't we? We want to live in light of the eternity that we have before us. And we're going to see that as we kind of work through um, today's passage. Because really what John has done is he said, look, in the first three verses, Christ is coming back. Now, we should all say a hearty amen to that, right? Christ is coming back for his church. He's coming back for his bride. And, and as we think about that, we need to be living as though he's going to come right now. As we think about that, should we not be, when, if Christ were to show up right here, right now, I would, I would be stoked because you're all here in church where we're supposed to be. Right? But what if he came back tomorrow or the next day? What if he came back 
you know, uh, three weeks from now, what would you be found doing? Where would you be at in life? Would you be doing the will and, and, uh, and purposes of God in your life? Or would you be doing what you want to do? Because as John said last week, what we can have the tendency to do is if we're not doing what God wants us to do, if we're not living the way that God wants us to live, if we're not walking in obedience to the scriptures, we can actually pull back from the presence of God. Much like Adam and Eve did in the garden, right? Remember that God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day? And as God's walking in the garden in the cool of the day, what happens? Adam and Eve run and hide. And, they, and he says, Adam, where are you? And then Adam comes out of the bushes wearing some ridiculous outfit that he made uh, prior to God arriving. And, and, he, and he says, God, we, we heard you coming and we were ashamed because we were naked and so we hid. We know what happens after that. Who told you that you were naked? We play the blame game for a little bit, but in reality they had disobeyed God. They were sinning before God. But didn't Adam and Eve also have the same tendency that we have as people? What was Adam's first response when he was confronted by God? Her fault. It's the woman you gave me. And the woman looks at Adam, probably like, I'm going to smack you when we get home. Uh, you know what I mean? But looks at her husband, and then she looks at the serpent and says, well, the serpent made me do it. You see, our tendency as human beings, even from the beginning of creation, is to deflect and defer our sin as really not that bad, or not our fault, or not as severe as we make it out to be. And as Christians, we have a great and precious hope and promise in Christ that we will be with him, right? We'll be like as he is. We'll receive new glorified bodies. And so the challenge that we're building off of this morning is to live in such a way that we live in light of that eternal promise and that eternal hope that we have. I am so thankful that one day I will have a new glorified body where there is no more sin, there's no more sorrow, there's no more guilt, there's no more shame. And we'll be perfect as he is perfect. We'll see the reality of what he's already done for us through our faith in Christ. But that's not right now, is it? No, right now we have the opportunity to live and please God in all that we say and all that we do. And you guys may be here this morning if you're like me saying, uh, well, that sounds good on paper. That sounds good when you say it. But the reality is I know me. And how many of you guys in here would say that you still struggle with sin this morning? Right? All of us. We all still struggle with sin. We all still fall short of that perfect standard of God, don't we? Well, what if I were to tell you this morning, you don't have to anymore? What if I were to tell you this morning, you don't have to continue to live a life of sin? Again, you might say, well, that sounds good. When you say it, but in reality, I know me. Well, I want to challenge us this morning as we begin to look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. But before we do that, we're going to pray. But as we begin to look at 4 through 10 this morning, I want to really challenge us to maybe say, if I'm just a sinner, if that is your default, or I'm always going to sin, or I'm always going to fall short, if that's your default, then you have a wrong line of thinking this morning. Now, I'm not saying that to be rude. I'm not saying that to be uh, demeaning or, or tear you down. I'm just saying, if that is our default as people, that I am a sinner, therefore I'm just going to keep on sinning, then we have a wrong line of thinking. Because if we know Christ, we have new life. And we don't have to sin anymore. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace this morning. God, thank you for the word of God that we have before us. Thank you that we can have church again. God, that we can be united together and enjoy fellowship and singing and and study of your word together, God. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts and Lord, that you would teach us and challenge us from your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so if you guys are taking notes, the first point this morning is there is a guiding principle of sin. A guiding principle of sin. And John makes it very clear in verse four what that principle is. So if you guys have your Bibles, you guys are following along. First John chapter three, verse four. Everyone who makes... A practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, I don't know about you. We've had some pretty graphic demonstrations of what lawless behavior looks like over the past couple of weeks, haven't we? If we've turned on the news or we've watched TV or opened Facebook in any capacity, we've seen riots, we've seen looting, we've seen uh, people being hurt and killed even. And we're not going to take time to get into political sides and what we should be saying but we have a picture of what lawlessness looks like it's it's anarchy it's it's chaos 
And John very clearly lays out for us that everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices this lawlessness. Because sin at its core is lawless. Is not sin by very definition missing the mark? When you read the definition of sin, isn't that what it is? There is a standard of perfection that God requires, and anything less than that standard perfection, uh, perfection is called sin. Right? Is sin ever good? No, sin is not ever good. Okay? In fact, sin is at its core rebellion against the holy nature and character of God. Was that not the first sin when you think about it? Not for humans, but for, for Satan. Who rebelled against God. Didn't he, didn't he rebel against God's holiness for he wanted to be God? You can read about that in Isaiah. But, but he says, look, sin at its core is rebellion against the holy nature and character of God. It's rebellion against the commandments of God. It's rebellion against the truth. And ultimately, it's rebellion against the freedom that we have in Christ. Zane C. Hodges writes, John now wrote about the sin which stands in opposition to the purity he had just referred to in verse 3. The NIV renders the statement, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Usually, in the Greek New Testament, anomia in, is a general term, like the, like the English word wickedness, which has some prominence in an eschatological context. That's talking about the end times. So it is used here so soon after references to the Antichrist may have been significant. The writer probably intended to, it to be a strongly pejorative, or that is expressing contempt or disapproval, description of sin. It seems likely in this view that 1 John 3, 7, that the Antichrist had softened the view of sin, which John wished to refute. A person who sins does what is wicked, and sin is wickedness. John was now insisting Sin must not be taken lightly. I just want to focus on that last part of that quote. John is now insisting that sin must not be taken lightly. We cannot ever sit there and go, oh, sin, it's really not that big of a deal. Because if God hates it, we should hate it. If sin separates us from God and ultimately will break our fellowship with Christ, then we should hate it and we should not want to have anything to do with it. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 9 says, the devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. Now, I said in the last service, and I'll say it now, all sin is an abomination before God. Now, we can't cherry-pick which sins we want to put into that category, as some have done in the past. We cannot pick and cherry-pick which ones we're going to protest. We need to look and say all sin is an abomination before God. All sin brings everybody to the standard of condemnation. All sin is hated and wicked before God. James chapter 4, verse 17 says, sin, sin is defined as this, the one who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So as believers, can we sit by idly? We may not be sinning, quote unquote. We may not part be participating in a certain deed or practice. But can we also not be doing anything that we're supposed to be doing at the same time? Sure. Sure. To know what is right and not do it is equally sin in the eyes of God as the person who just outright goes against and rebels against the command of Scripture. You see, that's important for us to remember because a lot of times we as Christians can become comfortable and complacent and really not do what we know we're supposed to do, what was the right thing to do. And John, uh, James simply says that is sin. John chapter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 17 says, All wrongdoing is sin. But there is sin that does not lead to death. What does the Bible say the wage of sin is? Death. Right? Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, would you guys all agree that there are sins that don't lead to death? Yeah. Everybody say yes. You know why? You're all sitting here this morning. Okay, okay we're all here this morning. Or if you're watching online, you're in your couch this morning, you're wherever you're watching this, there are sins that don't lead to death. But does it make it any less of an abomination before God? Does it make it any less hated by God? No. You see, the Word of God needs to be the authority over our thoughts and opinion and over our lives and everything we do. This book that God has given us is, to, is designed to be the authority over our lives. 
We are accountable to this. We are accountable to have spent time in this, to have read this, to have applied this to our lives so that we can live the life that he wants us to live. And really, that's what the next verse talks about in verse 5. Look at sin in light of who Christ is and what he's done. Now, I want to start. Uh, well, we're going to read the verse, then we're going to start at the back and work our way forwards. We're going to do a little loop-de-loop here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Now, this is a very simple and straightforward verse. I like this verse because it reminds us of the fact that, as we're going to look at first here, there is no sin in Christ. None whatsoever. He was perfect in every way. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 tells us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now, how many of us have ever looked at verse 16? Let us with confidence then draw near to the throne of God that we may find grace and obtain mercy to help in our time of need. How many of you guys have ever read that verse before? Anybody? Okay, two of you. I know there's not that many people, but we can still raise our hands and interact, okay? How many of you guys have ever used that verse to encourage somebody? I know as a pastor, I have often. Hey, we have grace and mercy at our disposal if we just simply go and ask God for it. But what, what, what's awesome about verse 15 is that grace and mercy, which we receive in, in, to help us in time of need, is predicated on the fact that Jesus was first sinless. That he was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he knows what you're going through. He knows the temptation that's at your doorstep. He understands and gets the, the, the hardship that you're facing and the, the, the contemplations with your flesh and carnality to go back to sin and enslave ourselves once again. The author of Hebrews got that. And he said, look, we have confidence in Christ because he's been where we've been. He's experienced what we're experiencing. He's gone through it. And now he stands as one who is without sin, able to give us grace and mercy to help in our time of need. See, the other thing he says here is not only was he without sin, but he came to take away the sins of the world. You see, in first or John chapter 1, verse 29, this is John the Baptist. He's pre uh, baptizing people in the Jordan River. And he says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, what's amazing about this is notice how he doesn't say, here comes Jesus who is going to pat you on the back and tell you everything's going to be fine. Or he doesn't say, here comes Jesus who is going to be okay with your sin. So keep living the way you're living. But just as long as you put your faith in him, you're fine. No, he says Jesus is coming and his purpose is to take away the sins of the world. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3 or 2 verses 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by the canceling of the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. All your guilt, all your shame, all your sin nailed to the cross of Christ, paid for, done away with, finished. And Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 to the church in Galatia. Now the, the history of this church is they went back to the law. They went back to the carnal way. They went back to trying to earn their way into heaven, prove themselves good enough for God. And Paul writes to them in chapter 5 and he says, For freedom's sake, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Paul's exhortation and admonition to the church of Galatia was to stand firm in your faith. Don't go back to sin because Christ has set you free from it. And you get the picture in the New Testament that Christ came to take away our sins. And if he came to take away our sins, then we can't continue living in sin. Because to do so is to continue to rebel against God, his holy character, but also to rebel against Christ himself. So how do we deal with this problem? Because as we already stated, how many of us have sinned this week? How many of us maybe even sinned this morning? 
How many of us have struggled with sin since the day we gave our lives to Christ? All of us, every single one of us. There's not one person who has given their life to Christ that doesn't wrestle with their flesh, that doesn't wrestle against the enemy who is coming and tempting our flesh, inciting our flesh to do the things that God would not have us do. And what John says next in, verses, in verse 6 is that we cannot say we abide in Christ and yet continue to sin. In verse 6 he said, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Hold on a second. What did he just say? Have you guys ever read this verse and gone, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. So when I first read this as a young believer, I began to say, so because I sinned, am I no longer in Christ? Because I've sinned, am I no longer knowing him? You see, and a, lot of, a lot of people take this verse and they say, see, right here, you can lose your salvation. I don't think that's what John's talking about. I don't think that's John's heartbeat here. Now, how many of you guys are familiar with the idea that oil and water don't mix? We're all familiar with this? Okay. Now, I make uh, balsamic vinaigrette. It's salad dressing. And one of the things you do is you pour the balsamic vinegar and then you pour the oil in. And, and what you notice in a jar, have you guys ever made this kind of dressing before? Okay, what happens is the oil separates from the vinegar, right? And then what I do is I put in a little bit of Dijon mustard, some honey and some other seasonings in there. And you put a lid on it, you shake it up. You shake it up until it all comes together, right? You guys ever done this before? And then what happens? The oil and the vinegar, they mix together. Before they were separate, but now they're mixed together. And I want to say this, that, that God doesn't intend for us to ever say, I'm going to live in Christ and yet continue to sin. That's like oil and water. But what we do as Christians is we, we throw other stuff in the mix and we shake it around and we say, see, it works. I can still live this way and still say I'm in Christ because look, it works. Well, let me tell you what. No matter how much extra stuff you throw in, no matter how much you glue you try to put around it, the fact of the matter is sin and righteousness, sin and holiness are polar opposites. They cannot mix. They do not work together. And so John says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. What John is saying, not that you lose your salvation, but rather that if we are abiding in Christ, guess what's not going to happen? If we are remaining in Christ, abiding in Christ, resting in Christ, let me tell you what's not going to happen in your life. You are not going to sin. If you are abiding in Christ, you are not going to sin. If you are sinning this morning, it's because you are not abiding in Christ. You are abiding in your flesh. And what he says here is that no one who sees God and knows God and is abiding in God keeps on sinning. What, what he's saying here is that sin is never produced from abiding in Christ. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says it this way. It cannot be shown anywhere in the New Testament that the present tense can bear this kind of meaning without the assistance of other words. Such a view is invalid for this verse and also for 1 John 3, 9. Nor is John saying that sinless perfection must be achieved. Oh, thank goodness. And those who fail to do so lose their salvation. Such notion is foreign to John's argument and all of Scripture. John's point is simple and straightforward. Sin is not, is not a product of ignorance and blindness towards God. Or sin is, sorry, a product of ignorance and blindness towards God. No one who sins has seen him or known him. Sin can never come out of seeing and knowing God. It can never be a part of the experience of abiding in Christ. No one who abides in him sins. This is a great promise from God. How many of you guys don't want to sin? Please, everybody raise your hand so I feel good about being a pastor today, okay? We don't want to sin. I don't want to sin. What do we do? When we feel sin, don't we feel, when we sin, don't we feel shame and guilt for it? Don't we feel bad? Oftentimes we have to go back and apologize either to others and God or just God himself. You see, when we see God, when we know God, our response is not to justify holiness or unholiness, but to rather realize unholiness still remains in us and surrender it to him. If you guys have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. In Isaiah chapter 6, you guys may be familiar with this. Isaiah is standing before the throne of God. And his experience is a powerful one for us to, to, 
contemplate and think about this morning. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of, and the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now it's Isaiah's response there that we need to take note of. He sees the glory of God. He's in the presence of God. He knows who God is. And his response is not to say, Oh, good. I'm okay. My sin really isn't that bad. No, he says, woe is me. He is basically calling down a curse upon himself, saying, look, I don't deserve to be here. I deserve condemnation. I deserve death. But yet here I am. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And we know what happens. The servant comes and gets a coal from the altar and touches his lips and cleanses him of his sin. Such a great illustration. And it fits with John's illustration that he's giving us. The one who abides in Christ does not sin. And really what it comes down to is we have to stop looking at sin the way that we do. Whether we're justifying it, condoning it, or whether we're saying it's something I'm never going to have victory over. Because victory is yours in Christ. We already have had Christ take away our sins. All is forgiven. And so we have to look and say, you know what, God? I'm going to view this differently. I'm going to look at sin differently. And what John says after that, he says, so now we need to take action. In verses 7 and 8, he says, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, and the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Isn't this a great verse of victory? I love this verse. Because he starts out with little children. This is a term of love and endearment, one that denotes concern. And he says, let no one deceive you. Now, we obviously know that John is bringing this back to the context from the previous chapter where he talks about the Antichrist, the false teachers, those who bring false doctrine. And obviously, they came in and they were telling you that sin really isn't that bad. Isn't that what our world does today? Look at the world around us. How many people will say, I don't go to church because your church holds to this view on this topic? I've had people sit at my kitchen table, ask me about very pointed cultural topics today, not which we're going to get into in this morning service, and just say, well, what does your church believe on this? And I have no other option than to say, you know what? What God's word says is what I hold to now, that doesn't mean we don't love people who don't hold to the same viewpoint we do. It doesn't mean that we're not gracious, kind, and merciful. But what it does mean is that we cannot buy into the lie that sin is okay. The false teachers would come and they would lessen the severity of sin, lessen the intensity of sin. And so John says, let no one deceive you. And really, when we look at who's behind those antichrists, it's not Satan, the one who is actually advocating for these lies and these Lessening of sin? Absolutely, because Satan's a liar. Those who are of Christ are not of this world anymore, and those who are deemed antichrist are Satan's false teachers who are liars and deceivers and only want to pull you away from Christ. Zane C. Hodges writes, The one who does right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Only righteousness springs from a righteous nature. By contrast, he who does what is sinful is of the devil. It would be wrong to water this assertion down. All sin, of whatever kind or degree, is satanic in nature. It is because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Sin originated with the Satan and, and, is his, and is his constant practice. To take part in sin at all is to take part in his activity. It is also, to, it is also opposing the work of the Son of God who came to put an end to that activity, the devil's work. Even the smallest sin runs counter to the work of Christ. Believers are to overcome the evil one, here called the devil, and to not participate in what he is. I love the way Zane C. Hodges wrote that. 
any sin of the smallest degree or severity is to participate in the satanic work of our enemy. Now, we need to think about sin that way. Not as it's okay or make an excuse or try to condone or try to lessen the severity. We need to look at it as, man, if I am choosing sin over the righteousness which I have in Christ, then we have a problem because I am choosing to follow the enemy rather than my Savior. I love what John says in the end of verse 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. Now, have you, have you guys seen The Passion of the Christ? Mel Gibson movie? One of my favorite parts of the whole movie. I don't agree with everything in the movie. But at the end, when Christ rises again from the dead, and you see the serpent kind of cruising through, and then Satan just, or Jesus just kind of goes, <laughs> crushes the head of Satan. I just love that depiction because that's what Christ did. Christ destroyed the work of the devil, the works of the devil. He put an end to them. Well, why is sin still around? Why is sin still prevalent in my life? And the only reason sin is around is because people still follow Satan. And the only reason sin exists in our life is because we allow it to be there. We allow Satan to work in our hearts and our lives rather than trusting God. Sin is alive in us only because we allow it to be. Because we choose sin over the righteousness and life that Christ has put within us. The perfect nature of Christ will never produce sin. Again, John is reiterating this point in verses 9 and 10 when he says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep sinning because he has been born of God. By, it, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does... Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Literally in the King James and in the Greek, it would say, whoever has been born of God does not sin. Now, how many of you guys would say you're born of God? How many of you guys would say, I don't sin? We all put our hands down. We just put our hands down. You see, what we need to realize here is when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, not only were we forgiven our sins, we were given new life. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and says, We are new creatures in Christ. Behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. We're new creatures in Christ. We've been given new life. In fact, he says, It is because the seed of God abides in us that we don't sin. And it's this point that he keeps making over and over again. If we are abiding in Christ, we are resting in Christ, remaining in Christ, then what happens is we don't sin. We sin when we choose to leave the fellowship we have with Jesus. That's what he said in the second part of verse 9. For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin. Again, if we are... In fellowship with God, we cannot sin because we are living out the righteous life that he has been put, that he has put within us. Again, Zane C. Hodges writes, One who is born of God does not sin precisely because God's seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. God's seed is his nature given to each believer at salvation. The point here is that the child of God or that the child partakes in the nature of the parent. The thought of a sinless parent who begets a child who only sins little or far from the, is little or far from the author's mind. As always, John dealt in stark contrast. All sin is devilish. It is not to stem, or it does not stem from the believer's regenerate nature, God's seed. But the child of God cannot and does not sin. The explanation here is the same that was given in verse 6. The new man... Is absolutely perfect, it is an absolutely perfect new creation. By insisting on this point, John was seeking to refute the false conception about sin. Sin is not, nor can ever be, anything but satanic. It can never spring from what a Christian truly is at the level of his regenerate being. I like that last, I always love the sentences that they end with. Sin is not, nor ever can be, anything but satanic. It can never spring from what a Christian truly is at the level of his regenerate being. You cannot produce sin from righteousness. 
God's life that he's given us is perfectly righteous. And so when we are functioning in that, it will never produce sin. A good illustration of this is found in James chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. If you guys are familiar with James chapter 3, it's talking about taming the tongue. How many of you guys have ever said something you wish you could take back? I could raise my hand all day for that one, right? Yeah, we've, we've said things we have to apologize for. We've said things that we regret. We've hurt people with our words. We've said and uh, done damaging things with our words. And, and James says, if you can control your tongue, what you say, your mouth, then you can control your whole body. Right? He said it's like a, a little rudder on a ship. It controls a great big ship, but it's just a tiny little thing in comparison. So it is with our tongue. It's just a tiny little muscle in our mouth, but it does great damage. In fact, he says it's set on fire with the fire's of hell. And when he's done explaining to us, he gets to verse 11 and 12. And he says, what we need to do is function in that regenerate new life, even in all areas of our life, even in what we say. And he says, does not a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh, or does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? No, right? We hope it doesn't, right? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So what he says here, he says, look, this is the illustration. This is the point. If we are abiding and functioning in Christ, we cannot produce anything other than righteousness in our lives. And he says, and this is evident. He says, you can tell who knows God and who doesn't. Because the one who knows God are the ones who practice righteousness. The ones who don't practice righteousness are the children of the devil. Because whoever practices unrighteousness is not of God. So I want you to think about that. Because the way that we live matters, doesn't it? We have a, an opportunity. Although it's small in the grand scheme of eternity, but God has given us a life here and now, a life where we know him and are privileged to know him. And we have the opportunity to now share Jesus Christ with other people. Don't we? We now have the opportunity to share our faith and give hope to other people who need Jesus. That's an incredible, not only responsibility, but privilege. But the way that we live validates the message that we preach. Do you guys believe that? The way that we live validates the message that we preach. I have a life lesson that I carry with me everywhere I go. Literally sits on the shelf in my office in, in a Bible that people wrote messages in when I would leave a certain area that I'd been at for a while. And I worked at a place called in and out and my training manager, his name was Sammy, and we got to know each other. And I used to show up to work all the time wearing this shirt that said Hardcore Christian. And I would share my faith with people. And I would, I would, uh, I would not go to the parties afterwards that they would go with. And, and so one, one day after work, Sammy and I decided we were going to go out and grab some food. So we went and we grabbed some food. And uh, I, had, I think I had steak and fries. He had chicken and fries. And, and we, were, uh, we were sitting there talking. And, and we, the thing that we did is I, is I had a beer and he had a beer. And you guys may think, well, what's the big deal? Well, the reason, part of the reason I, I, I don't believe in drinking is because of what he wrote in my Bible. He wrote in my Bible to Jeremy, the hardcore Christian that drinks. And what he said there spoke to my heart because you know what he said? What you say and what I see are different. What I say and what I see, what you say and what I see are completely different things. And it broke my heart. Because as Christians, we shouldn't want to ever put forth a picture of anything other than Christ. We should not want to live in such a way that we do anything other than glorify Christ. We should, at every level of our lives with Jesus Christ, desire to live in such a way that it validates the message that we're preaching. The message that we're sharing with other people. That's the call of John here. Live in such a way that it represents and reflects the message that you preach. Because let me tell you what, can a good message be destroyed by somebody who doesn't live out the message of Jesus? I remember when, uh, when the George Floyd riots were happening. And I, I was, we were on a walk and I, I was talking with Dave there. And you know what I said? I said, Dave, I said, they may have a very valid message that things need to change, that things need to be different. 
Very valid message, but to me it's ruined by the fact that you're burning down stores and hurting people and breaking all the stuff. And so a good message, a valid message can be invalidated by the way that we live. So it's important that we take what John says seriously, that we listen and heed his words. Abiding in Christ never produces unrighteousness. Abiding in the flesh, however, will. And it can invalidate a lot of opportunity for ministry and an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. So this morning, as we draw to a close, I want to challenge us to four different things. Four different things. Number one, if you are a saved individual, then realize that you are a new creature in Christ. You're a new creature in Christ. And that new nature is revealed through the practice of obedience and righteousness. You reveal who you are in Christ as you obey and practice righteousness. The second thing I want you to take home with you today is to never downplay the severity of sin. All sin is satanic and needs to be viewed severely. Never downplay the severity of sin. Don't justify it. Don't condone it. Don't make it okay. The third thing I want you to take away is seek to live in such a way that who you are in Christ is manifested in every area of your life. Whether that's with your family, whether that's in your workplace, whether that's uh, when you're having coffee with your friends, whether it's say you're out on your boat fishing, whatever it is you're doing, are we manifesting the reality of who we are in Christ? And the fourth thing I want you to take home is that this world needs Christians who walk worthy of the manner in which they've been called. This world needs Christians to be like Christ so that they can see Jesus at work in us. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy. God, thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you continue to do in and through us by the power of your spirit, by the word of God. God, may you continue to transform us and may God, may we see the need and reality just to rest and abide in who we are in Christ as we remain in you. God, thank you so much for the new life that we have. May we live it as we go forth from this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.